Hello my dear friends, how is it going? I hope I find you all in good health and safe and sound. I'm Ari Thurger and today I'm going to talk about Thor and answer the question if Thor is indeed a war god or not. <laughs> uh, this is the very first video of uh, 2022, so I bid you all a very fond welcome to this new year. As you know it, every year I choose a theme on which I focus more than others throughout the year, a theme that I always find to be the right one to elaborate on according to what it feels to be the general atmosphere of the world in a given year and the mental approach we need to take. So this year I think it will be good to focus on two main themes, Thor and magic, separately. Thor, because last year I've already presented a general introduction to the cult of Thor, and this year I shall elaborate on several subjects I have previously presented concerning the cult of Thor, precisely. And because this year I think we need what the god Thor often expresses, which is strength of mind and spirit, perseverance, a sense of community, humanity's strength, power and will to overcome nature's obstacles, and the survival by mutual help and together taking care of the land. Things will only get worse before they get better and it will take some time. That was cheerful. <laughs> uh, I also choose magic as the main theme I shall elaborate on throughout this year in this channel because in all our daily struggles, both personal but also the struggles to carry on living within this world, we must not forget the sense of wonder and awe-inspiring moments that brings us closer to the feeling of being eager to live and enjoy the time that is given to us. I think these are two themes we shall need for this new year, so I shall explore them in this channel on its sixth year of existence. Thank you for, thank you all for being in here and, uh, well, <laughs> now, with no more delay, let's start our today's video, my dear friends. Please. <laughs> so, is the Old Norse god Thor a war god? I'll save you the trouble to go through this entire video in search for the answer and give it right away. The answer is no. Thor isn't a war god or a god with any relation to war. So, throughout this video, let us explore why and the entire research just, just to get to a simple no. A god of war is a deity that has clear connections to war, obviously, either as a sort of commander or a leader and instigates battle. The entire expression and essence of a war deity is to foment war and conflict and uh, clear violence, or at the very least it is a deity directly participating in war, in conflict. In Norse mythology, as it comes down to us in the surviving written sources, Thor does not participate in wars and does not instigate conflict. He may be portrayed as a violent god, but he's never involved in a war unless it is the final conflict of the, the gods at Ragnarok, in which practically every deity has a role to play, but that doesn't make all the gods war gods or warrior gods just because they are forced to participate in the very famous conflict to end all conflicts. Uh, Thor's violence is usually against giants, and he doesn't fight them accompanied by an, an army, uh, nor does he fight against many giants all at once. Thor's myths are actually very clear in building an image of Thor fighting alone against a, a single giant uh, at specific occasions. In other words, Thor always has to face one single adversary. Taking this into account, what Thor actually does is fighting duels, single combat. In that case, Thor could be considered a god of duels as well, and it, it wouldn't actually be surprising that Thor would have been one of the gods called upon to witness duels, such as Home Ganga, uh, as a legal way to settle disputes between two parties. A duel to solve disputes, which we know the gods were called upon as witnesses, so most likely Thor would be one of such deities. It's not just in Norse mythology that uh, we don't find any evidences to support the idea that Thor is a war god. 
the gods also mark their presence in sagas, and uh, Thor is never mentioned as a war god or with any relation to war or battle in the sagas. A, a duel isn't a battle, right? We can also take into consideration canings. A caning, uh, in a simple and more straightforward explanation, um, in Scandinavian medieval literature, it is an element of poetic language formed by a word, or more often than not, a, a, or a combination of words that do not portray the original meaning of these words, but rather an implied meaning for another element. Hence, it is always necessary to have a, a deep knowledge of Norse mythology to understand a caning. Uh, let me give you uh, an example. Since we are talking about Thor, a caning for Thor is Heinridi, uh, and it also appears in the form of Andridi, uh, which means roughly translating the one who rides alone. The kinning isn't um, referring to a single random person, nor is it referring to the action of riding, but instead the one who rides alone is in reference to Thor. In a poetic composition, instead of directly saying Thor, Heinridi, is used instead, and those who are familiar with the myths understand that this is a reference to Thor, and not a random rider. Uh, by this canning alone, we already understand how medieval Scandinavians understood Thor. A lonely god, he fights alone, he fights in single combat. So it's important to say that there are many canings for many gods, giants, actions, activities, lengths, landscape features, other entities, etc. And when looking at the lists of canings for Thor, it does not have any reference to war. It's not like Odin, right, who is sometimes called Her Tyr, uh, god of hosts, implying an aspect of Odin as a commander, a, a leader of battle hosts, or Sik Tyr, uh, the war god of victory, or, or god of victory, or simply war god. So, Thor doesn't have any canings related to war or battle or conflict. Thor's canings usually reflect on the gods' power or might or strength. Perhaps the immediate idea that comes to mind and gives us a sense that Thor may be a war god is precisely because he is quite often portrayed as a god in a duel with some giant. A seemingly conflict with giants and this fervent need to go out there and fight giants. Well, uh, as I have quickly explained on the video about the spirits and entities of uh, Norse mythology, many giants in Old Norse myths uh, by themselves are already canings, uh, in reference to forces of nature or landscape features. If we take into consideration that Thor was in fact a god related to agriculture and fertility of the soils, and the most important and famous god for late Iron Age and early medieval Scandinavians, and indeed a god often present in the lives of farmers, and he is portrayed in the myths as a god of the people, of the common folk, of the great majority of the medieval Scandinavian um, population, composed by farmers, fishers and artisans, well, uh, we understand that Thor's might and strength expresses the human efforts of those who worked the soils and transformed the natural elements of the earth, uh, creating tools and utensils, uh, the human struggle against the forces of nature, taming nature, domestication of landscape features for agriculture, clearing clearing the, the soils, breaking stone, shaping accentuated reliefs, breaking mountains, the cyclical struggles to grow food for sustenance and the constant weather phenomenon and its impact upon the crops. Overall, the human efforts and struggles against nature and the forces of nature. And Thor was the god called upon mostly by farmers. And being an earth god, a god of thunder, and in an animistic perspective being the very thunder person, Thor was called upon to protect the crops, give fertility to the crops, and to protect from nature's disasters. Thor's duels against giants is Thor's relationship with the natural forces of, na of nature, obviously. And I'm not simply saying that this is only a question or, or, 
of personification of uh, natural elements and or metaphors. Some of them are, of course, obviously, as elements that embellish poetry or to create a mind image for the audience and even creating comparisons by creating metaphors that help people to remember traditional aspects of their cultures and to explain ritual within a culture by precisely creating connections easy to memorize and preserve in oral tradition. But it's not only or just that. We must not forget that these religious and ritual elements come from a pre-Christian animistic past. So Thor was considered as the thunder person, as an actual entity who sometimes works as the mediator between humans and giants. Giants in an animistic worldview understood as persons of the world, as spirits, if you will, of the earth, of a specific hill, mountain, a particular forest, a river, a specific region or portion of land, land spirits, land vethir, uh, entities that inhabit specific parts of the natural world, and human persons interact with these entities precisely by being within their habitats. And the very action of agriculture or the exploration of natural resources is an action which, in an animistic mentality, is the direct disturbance of the habitat of these powerful entities of place. So Thor is the god that would serve as the mediator, but also as the protector of human persons, dueling against these giants, these persons of the natural world, to help humans thrive by exploiting natural habitat. Archaeologically speaking, we see that Thor progressively becomes a very important deity among farmers and um, other individuals of the Scandinavian uh, populations that work the fields. And Thor's importance and cult increases as the very exploration and colonization and settlement of the land also increases. There's a continuous growth in Thor's importance that follows the, the continuous exploration and settlement of the land itself. The idea of Thor being a mediator isn't that far-fetched, by the way. Um, if we take on the study of comparative mythological material and see the similarities between, uh, for instance, uh, Thor, Indra and uh, Hercules, these three are the sons of the god of heaven and, and the earth goddess, and as such they work as mediators between gods and humankind. Of course, uh, there are other important uh, differences, but some similarities are undeniable. But on that field, it's better to develop on another video. Returning to what we were saying, I think we should also take in mind that giants in Norse mythology, when understood as entities of the natural world, do have a lot of similarities uh, with the Stalo, uh, which are the giants of Same mythology. And in the Norse myths themselves, some giants are the portrayal of the Same people. So there's also cultural syncretism, syncretism here and Thor's relationship with giants which sometimes is hostile and sometimes is friendly or in other words sometimes is disagreeable and sometimes is beneficial is also a portrayal of the relationships between old Norse populations with the Same populations. Uh, for some reason many Scandinavians or some Scandinavians uh, don't like to hear this but at least until the 7th century of the Common Era final stages of Scandinavian Iron Age, about 78% at least of the Scandinavian peninsula was occupied by the Sami. Still, during the migration period there's an increase of Germanic peoples in the Scandinavian peninsula and they are mostly centered in the south and along the southern coasts. Late Iron Age and the Viking Age mark a considerable change of populations in Scandinavia coming from the south and a uh, continuous growth of non-Sami peoples from south to the north occupying former Sami territories. So there were obvious conflicts but also beneficial exchanges, which went on for thousands of years prior to the Viking Age, people coming and going, right? However, there are many archaeological evidences that indicate that Sami people between 550 and 1350 uh, lived much further south on the Scandinavian peninsula than they do nowadays. And indeed, Sami and other Scandinavian non-Sami populations have had several periods of relative symbiotic relationships. Iron Age um, Sami 
coastal farmers in the north live in hierarchically organized chiefdoms and established alliances with powerful groups in southern Scandinavia. But they have progressively lost territories with the advance of southern populations, especially during the Viking Age and during the Swedish colonization process uh, from around the, um, the 14th century until practically the 20th century, with a special incidence in the 17th and the 18th centuries. I know many people believe that the Sami have always lived a semi-nomadic life, fishing and hunting, reindeer herding, but what happened to the Sami happened to many other indigenous peoples, including, of course, Native American indigenous peoples. They were also farmers at, at, at a certain point, for a, a long period actually, and had plenty of other activities. They too have passed through the Neolithic, Copper Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and so on and so forth. They weren't always in a static sort of Mesolithic period, as evidenced by archaeology and great uh, megalithic complexes, burial mounds, metal tools, pyramids, vast periods of intense agriculture, etc. The great majority of indigenous peoples only became nomadic or semi-nomadic again and resorting to hunting, fishing and occasionally herding due to colonialism and the intensive exploita exploitation of natural resources and occupation of territory by colonial populations that forced indigenous populations to lose territories and natural resources, forcing native peoples to move further away from fertile lands and having no other choice but to resort to other means of sustenance and survival. Uh, this is all written in the archaeological context, right? Many people don't want to believe in this or refuse to believe in it and reinforce a primitive portrayal of indigenous peoples by constructing an alternative history of indigenous peoples, always very primitive in their cultures and traditions, both because some people don't want to admit uh, the great cultural advances of indigenous history and also because people are obviously and naturally ashamed of their colonial past and refuse to admit that their countries have had a shameful colonial past. But listen, I'm from a country with a very shameful colonial past, one of the worst, if not the worst, far worse than what is usually portrayed in history books. But it's not by denying or trying to forget that past that it will solve anything. The problems of the past still have terrible consequences nowadays and many people still suffer because of the problems of the past and because we refuse to acknowledge those problems. Right now, you and I, uh, we are not responsible for the problems our ancestors have created. However, we are responsible for the actions we decide to take right now during our lifetime. We are responsible for what we choose to do in our lifetime. So it, it's not trying to, or by, by, by trying to deny what has happened in the past that we, we will solve anything. It's acknowledging it and working to fix the problems created by our ancestors so it won't happen again. And, and I'm sorry, I, I'm specifically saying this because each time I speak of Scandinavian colonialism in this channel, uh, there are some Scandinavians uh, that completely lose their minds and call me a liar and try to cover it all up. Uh, to be honest, uh, most often, or, or more often than not, the great majority of negative expressions towards this comes from non-Scandinavians who deny the existence and impact of colonialism as a whole. I have had serious conflicts with people like this. Uh, if, it, if it is of any consolation which is which it isn't, uh, of course it isn't. Uh, the colonial past of my country is far worse than yours, but I don't try to deny it because that helps in nothing at all. So it's important to remember this concerning the occupation of Sami territory also in the Viking Age and both the derogatory con uh, connotations, uh, but also symbiotic relationships between Old Norse and Sami people, but also between Thor and giants. And some giants in Norse myths also portray the real interactions between Old Norse people and Sami during the intensive connections provoked by the demands of fur trade. In fact, the myths of Thor and his relationship with giants start to have greater 
development during the Viking Age, precisely, which coincides, archaeologically speaking, with a rekindled relationship between Old Norse people and the Sami in the Viking and early medieval period of Scandinavia, as the northern fur trade intensified due to demands from adjacent societies in Norway and Russia. This relationship provoked uh, by um, competition and the stress from outside demands created a, a new and intensive material and literary culture. Both the archaeological and literary evidences indicate the relationship built between Nordic or Old Norse and Sami during this period, sometimes pointing to mutual respect and a symbiotic relationship, sometimes harassment and exploitation. So it's also curious to remember these social factors and how they shape mythology as well. In the case, uh, in this particular case, some of Thor's conflicts or friendships with giants portray interactions between Old Norse and Sami populations, as well as cultural syncretism and syncretic belief systems. I should also like to point out that perhaps one of the reasons as to why Thor may be wrongly understood to be a war god is precisely because of his weapon, the famous hammer Mjolnir. I've talked about Mjolnir before uh, and uh, on other videos I have expressed several facts about it, so I'm not going to develop much on this. However, suffice it to say, Mjolnir means grinder, right? Uh, more specifically, the grinding of wheat. More than a weapon, Mjolnir is a tool with which the domestication of flora is possible. A utensil with which taming the land, planting, growing and harvesting food for sustenance is possible. Thor was a farmer's god, a god of crops and fertility. And the very phallic shape of the tool reinforces the fertility aspects of Thor, attested by mythology as well, and Thor's relationship with the world serpent Jormungandr which has been wrongly translated as a giant monster, when in fact the very term Gander indicates both spirit and magical projectile, from which it also derives the word Gondol, which serves as both the magic tool of the Volva, the Old Norse prophetess, but also a phallus. Jormungandr is none other than a symbol of protection, but also the personification of feminine earth entities. And Mjolnir, Thor's fertility tool, is the very utensil through which, or with which, Thor expresses fertility upon the soils by the interaction with the giants of the earth. Jormungandr is the very entity of the earth itself, the feminine power of the soils. In the myths, Thor is always after the, the world serpent, always following it, seeking it, wanting to fervently catch it. Jormungandr is also known as Midgard's Hormur, literally Midgard Serpent. A better translation for Jormungandr would be Mighty Earth Spirit, as Jormun is the Mighty One, and Gandr is the spirit emissary, wand, or magical projectile found in the sources related to Seidr as a feminine magical art. Jormungandr is also an old poetic name for the Earth itself, giving another possible translation as mighty ground or mighty earth, as in literally the soils of the world with which Thor, as a thunder god of fertility, constantly struggles with plowing the earth with his phallic-shaped tool, Mjolnir, which serves to grind wheat, the same way a farmer plows the earth to grow food, creating life and sustenance from the fertility of the soils. Fertility only possible by revolving the earth and plant food just the same way Thor revolves the earth to propitiate fertility. These facts alone should be more than enough to express the attributes of Thor as a fertility god and god of the crops and not a war god. However, I would like to touch another point uh, as I've developed previously on other videos, the, the things here said about Mjolnir and the relationship between Thor and Jormungandr, so there's no point in repeating myself all over again. Perhaps the idea that leads um, to the mistake of seeing Thor as a war god is precisely due to, to his hammer, but on a modern context this time. There's usually the idea that Vikings used Thor's hammer around their necks, so this gives the, the impression that Thor would be 
the patron god of Vikings. <laughs> However, this image um, is heavily fomented by TV series, movies and gaming. Thor was indeed, at some point already during the Viking, um, the Viking period of Scandinavia, the most beloved god. So it wouldn't be strange to see several depictions of Thor's hammer, which was, after all, the very symbol representative of the god himself. So, instead of an actual anthropomorphization of Thor, to serve as a religious object of devotion, the representative phallic symbol of Thor would suffice to have the protective presence of the deity nearby. And indeed, I underline protective, as the great majority of runic inscriptions of an apotropaic character evoke Thor. In fact, Thor's hammers that were worn about the neck are the only indication from the archaeological record of talismans associated with a specific deity of Scandinavian early medieval period, reinforcing the idea that Thor was probably the most important deity of late paganism in the north. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not even going to elaborate on the fact that Vikings were not a people and Vikings were not just warriors, but an actual activity usually related to seafaring activities that were not just with the objective of raiding. Certainly, some Vikings would use Thor's hammer around their necks, no doubt, but so would the great majority of the populations in Scandinavia, which were farmers, artisans, fishers, traders, Mm. Uh, perhaps traders not so much as they would be on a different hierarchical level within medieval Scandinavian society uh, with a um, considerable social status that would socially detach them from the common folk and enter into the nobility panorama. But indeed, Thor was a farmer's god, a god of the common folk, a god of slaves as well. So. Thor was the god of the people, and many people that were not specifically engaging in the activity of going Viking would wear Thor's hammer, as it is attested by, once again, archaeology. More than a weapon, Thor's hammer was a protective symbol, a symbol of the, the farming community, a symbol of fertility, a farmer's utensil and magical tool that propitiates fertility in the soils. Not particularly just a piece of jewelry for warriors or for, for those engaging in the activity of Viking. Thor was not a patron god of warriors or, or, or people engaging in battle, conflict or extreme violence. This doesn't mean that some warriors would not be using Thor's hammer. I'm sure they would. Not because they were warriors, but because most warriors were farmers working for a landlord or a regional lord, and their god was Thor, as they were part of the farming community. However, occasionally they would join the personal levy or levies of their lords, uh, the same way other lords, kings, and even knights of medieval regions, states, kingdoms, and countries around Europe would do, enlist or recruit for military service their subjects farmers and artisans forcibly following their lords into war. So indeed, some Scandinavian warriors would have Thor's hammer as a protective charm. But this doesn't make Thor the patron god of warriors. Not to mention that the great majority of Thor's hammers are actually found in graves of people of farming communities and some lords and ladies landowners. And the great majority of Thor's hammers are actually found on or within uh, women's graves. And not specifically just on women who were also warriors, but women whose entire grave arrangements indicate their position as women of an household, ladies, owners of property and land. Thor's hammer is, after all, a fertility tool. And archaeologically speaking, more women's graves have been found with depictions of Thor's hammer rather than man's graves. Since Mjolnir is the grinder of wheat, we are in the presence of the tool the people of the household would use to, to literally grind wheat as an important food resource in their economy. So women would carry around their necks Thor's hammer as both the fertility tool, a phallus, <laughs> but also the tool to grind wheat 
which was an important food resource in their daily lives, a symbol that combines two important activities that led to the transformation of a resource into a consumable, which is the plantation of wheat and carrying the primary material into the household to be transformed into flour. Thus, in this sense, Thor's hammer symbolizes both men and women and their activities of farming and grinding wheat. Don't forget that Thor's wife is Sif, the, the goddess with the golden hair, symbolizing the fer fertilized wheat fields ready to be harvested. Perhaps this explains why the great majority of Thor's victims are female giants, female giants, reinforcing Thor's relationship with with female or feminine magic. Not just fertility magic, right? But perhaps we are in the presence of the social and religious struggles towards feminine magic, such as Seder. And uh, as Scandinavia progressively moves towards the conversion to Christianity, female magic becomes even more frowned upon in the Scandinavian Christian society. So the great majority of Thor's victims are feminine, are female. Uh, perhaps implying the newly patriarchal religious power overshadowing feminine magic. However, it could just as well be a portrayal of Thor's relationship with the fertility of the earth, which is, after all, usually portrayed as female, and, as such, giants seen as persons of the earth in an animistic sense. Thor's interactions to bring about fertility is a combination of the Thunder God's fertility powers with those of the Earth, making Thor's seemingly victims female in their great majority, as perhaps a portrayal of the chaotic sexual release of nature. And perhaps it's also important to refer that Thor's hammer was actually a response towards Christianity. Um, not particularly the concept of uh, Thor having a tool named Mjolnir in um, oral tradition, so the, con the conception is pre-Christian, of course, but the actual physical representation of Thor's hammer was conceived to wear around one's neck as a response towards Christianity. In, in the near future, I, I shall make a video solely on the cultural syncretism and social engagement that gave rise to the fabrication of Thor's hammers uh, as, 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 as a physical object to be worn around, um, or uh, as jewelry due to the contact with Christianity. And I've already shown you uh, on other videos that by the 9th and 10th centuries, at least, um, there were molds to cast both Christian crosses and Thor's hammers at the same time, due to the fact that many Scandinavians by this spirit were not just pagans. Some were still pagans, of course, some were Christian already, and some were both pagan and Christian all at once, as Christ became yet another god to be added to the pantheon of Scandinavian gods. And indeed, in Viking Age graves uh, in Scandinavia, since at least the 9th century of the Common Era, obviously, we already find Christian and pagan material culture together. But I think the, uh, this, this, this is important to remember in relation to Thor's hammer, uh, that it, it isn't solely a protective and fertility symbol, but also its physical conception is a response towards Christianity. The oldest depictions of Mjolnir are not found in Scandinavia, but in fact in old Saxon and Frisian contexts, 6th and 7th centuries, centuries, and as far as the 8th century in, of, of continental Europe, which isn't an ordinary period, but the conquest and the conversion of old Saxons and Frisians by the Christian Frankish Empire. And these hammers appear not as a response as some kind of holy war going on between Christians and pagans, but the necessity to show a cultural religious object to match the Christian custom of wearing the Christian cross around the neck. Not a spiteful response, but more on the grounds of appreciating a custom and wanting to do the same by creating the, the physical representation of a god beloved to old Saxons and Frisians. And this religious symbolism finally reaches Scandinavia around the 8th century, uh, and uh, Thor's hammer becomes quite famous as a, as a piece of jewelry representative of a beloved god increasing in popularity by this period. 
But by the time this custom reaches Scandinavia, it also reaches the Christian cross as another piece of jewelry of another protective symbol, representative of another god that is also gaining popularity by this time. So there's this merging of religions and belief systems that creates a beautiful material culture as the product of a response towards the appreciation of certain customs of other religious tra traditions. It's by this time that molds are created to fabricate both Christian crosses and Thor's hammers. As protective symbols of a syncretic character. So this, is, this, this also reinforces Thor's hammer as a protective symbol when it was finally conceived as an actual physical object representative of a beloved god to be carried around for, for, uh, around the neck for uh, protection and fertility and as a symbol of a belief system well established in the north by the Viking period. Thor's name itself gives us a good indication of the characteristics of this deity. The name is etymologically identical with thunder, and the deity itself drives or is depicted riding a chariot through the skies. Thor is a, a, a thunder god, or better still, Thor is a weather god. If we take um, the accounts of Adam of Bremen uh, to be reliable sources of information from the point of view of a Christian witness, <laughs> he specifically says that Thor is concerned with the fertility of the soil and with thunder and lightning. And, th and that's it. No specific mention of uh, relation with war. Fertility of the soils, thunder and lightning coincides with the mythological material. The myths of Thor fighting giants doesn't have to necessarily be the proof that Thor is a war god or a god related to conflict. Not just because of <laughs> what I, I said previously concerning giants uh, as entities of the natural world uh, in uh, an animistic worldview, nor the fact that the motif of the world serpent has been highly misunderstood by scholars of the 19th century with a um, predis predisposition to construct a fake Indo-European mythology based on an idea that Indo-Europeans were one single people living in a warlike society. And in fact, the idea of the world serpent being a representation of evil is something that was fomented by Christianity. Just like 19th century scholars, purposely misinterpreting and dismissing several evidences to construct an idea that serves their own religious and political purposes. As in fact, the idea of certain gods fighting giant serpents isn't a war motif. It isn't a motif related to conflict or the fight between good and evil, but in fact a fertility motif of the chaotic relationship between weather gods and the serpent representative of feminine fertility power of the earth, portrayed as a seemingly cosmic conflict to better illustrate the chaotic and natural phenomenon that propitiates life, creating a mind image through oral tradition to illustrate the chaotic and brutal sexuality of the natural world. Weather gods are often portrayed as pursuing and killing monsters that threaten the cosmos and uh, all its inhabitants. This doesn't mean that such weather gods are related to war and conflict. This motif represents their protective aspects, protection of humanity, of, of humankind. Weather deities are usually guardians of the cosmos and the promoters of fertility because there are natural forces and elements that prevent fertility from thriving. And, and I, I must say, this isn't just a question of metaphors, but also the animistic idea that some non-human and non-animal persons of the world manifest themselves through natural elements that aren't always beneficial for life to thrive and exist. Therefore, these persons, entities and elements are very much the, the opposite of what is manifested in order for life to thrive. In other words, forces of infertility. For instance, a drought as a prolonged period of abnormally low rainfall leading to a shortage, a shortage of water 
which in an animistic sense can be caused by a variety of entities or, or being the result of a series of disrespectful behaviors from the part of humanity towards certain other than human persons which get angry and seek revenge. So there's the necessity of other types of persons that serve as mediators to help human persons and to end a drought. These mediators can be human shamans, of course, bargaining and reasoning with the injured persons or any type of person, spirit or element that is causing a drought and an exchange of gifts or sacrifices is to be held in order to bring back natural conditions that are propitious and life may thrive. Or these persons can be weather persons, which suffer a deification when they are brought into the religious panorama. And in an animistic sense, some weather persons become weather gods. Who better than a deity related to thunder, rain and storms to end a drought? Such a weather deity fighting monsters, driving off other powerful persons that cause more negative impacts upon life and nature. Thus, weather gods promote fertility. I'm specifically focusing on, on this animistic perception because Old Norse mythology has several animistic conceptions. And throughout Norse mythology, we can still see the impact of the animistic consciousness of Viking Age Scandinavians on their perception of the world and how they interacted with the natural world. The interaction with the landscapes, with weather phenomenon and the symbiotic relationships created with the persons of the world um, inhabitants of the natural landscapes and prominent l l landscape features and within the weather of the world itself. The case of Thor and the other weather or thunder deities isn't just or only an explanation for weather phenomena and the natural elements in the sky and not just an animistic perception of other than human persons which inhabit in the sky or manifest themselves through specific phenomenon, but also humanity who seeks support and aid from weather entities and or, and or weather gods to protect against the, the, the destructive and chaotic forces of the natural world, which by themselves can also be understood as specific other than human persons, seeking to build symbiotic relationships with weather persons for the benefit of humanity. In this way, Thor, in an animistic sense, is much more of a protective deity promoter of fertility, and such an idea is reinforced by archaeology itself. Thor's hammers and apotropaic runic inscriptions evoking Thor as talismans and charms for protection and to promote fertility, and Thor as the god called upon to protect against the infertility forces that assail the natural resources humanity needs for sustenance and survival. In this way, it isn't strange that Scandinavian warriors, as well, would also wear Thor's hammer around their necks. Not as much as Thor as a patron god of warriors, but a talisman of protection from the part of a god who is, after all, a good fighter. Not fighting to provoke war or, or a, a, as, as a battle commander, but fighting to protect humanity and promote fertility, which is an essential element to promote life itself. After all, Thor was the god of the great majority of the social classes in early medieval Scandinavia. In late paganism, such social classes in the hierarchical structure of Viking Age society considered to be below nobility, such as farmers, fishers, artisans, common warriors, some traders and slaves. The god of the ordinary people, per se, and not the patron god of the, of the warlords, making Thor the god of the common folk, right? A helper, mediator, and the most trusted friend to whom people resorted in times of need when the chaotic forces of nature acted against the fertility powers of the earth. To finalize this video, I think it's important to refer to the Scandinavian colonization of Iceland uh, as another strong indicator of the roles of Thor as a god whose cult remained quite active in Iceland. Uh, and um, it indicates precisely the fertility characteristics of Thor associated with the farming communities. It's important to remember that the great majority of the surviving written sources on Norse myths comes from Iceland. 
which is important to reflect on because this has altered the myths but also added new perspectives to the myths. The first Icelanders were already familiar with Christianity and by the 11th century Catholicism was the official religion of Iceland. And to deny the great impact this religious background has had on Nordic peoples is to fail on the attempt to understand their culture and their mythologies, religion and belief systems by this period. I know some neo-pagans who are more predisposed to follow uh, Nordic pagan belief systems don't feel comfortable in accepting and even acknowledging the um, Christian religious themes in Norse mythology itself, but this is history. But it's not just the impact of religion, it's also the impact of the geographical features and climate of Iceland that has had a great impact upon the minds of Icelanders who wrote the great majority of the surviving sources on Norse myths and their interaction with both the landscape and the climate of Iceland that has led them to develop several different materials of Norse mythology that would fit into their daily reality. Many of the conceptions uh, expressed in Norse mythology reflect the harsh elements and weather of Iceland that farmers had to deal with, struggle against on a daily basis, combined with the religious conceptions of Christianity, creating a syncretism of ideas to better fit into their social, economic, political and religious reality in Iceland. So some of Thor's conflicts with giants is the portrayal of the real struggle of farmers in the harsh environment of Iceland. So, during the colonization of Iceland, Thor was the, the god most revered at that point. The first Icelanders, the first Icelandic settlers and colonizers were farmers, not warriors. This makes all the difference in terms of, of understanding the role of the gods. The groups of people who emigrated to Iceland took their wives and children with them. They were not set, setting out to go to war. They took their farming tools, their dom domesticated animals. They set out to find a new place to carry on with their lives. They took with them everything that made their home. And quite literally, as they also took the pillars of the seat of honor belonging to the head of the family, as a sign of continuity in the new land. I've talked about this before, the so-called high seat pillars, the Honvegisulur, upright pillars of the high seat, that is, of the seat of honor of the owner of the house. They were sculpted, carved or painted with the image of, of a divinity. The Norwegians who were going to settle in Iceland threw them overboard, with the declared intention of seeing how the tutelary deity led them to the place where it was convenient to settle. According to the sources, these pillars had the likeness of Thor depicted on them. When the settlers came near the shore, they wanted Thor to point out their future homesteads to them. Therefore, they threw the pillars overboard with a promise that they would build their new homes on the site where these pillars with the image of Thor would wash ashore. They did this because they trusted Thor. It was their beloved god and the most revered by this period in the north. And these settlers trusted Thor to rule their entire life, especially their new life on an unknown place with an uncertain future. These people were farmers and obviously wanted to continue their life as farmers in Iceland. This represents a clear allegiance to Thor from the part of farmers, which is another factor that demonstrates that Thor was indeed a farmer's god, the god of the common folk, of ordinary people. This can also be applied to Vikings uh, revering Thor in the British archipelago, as well as in Norway. These Vikings were originally farmers, whose beloved god was Thor, who has protected them all of their lives in their homes. When setting out into the British Isles, farmers became Vikings to become settlers and become farmers again in a farm, foreign country. Hence, also finding uh, Thor's hammers in an archaeological Viking Age context of the British Isles. 
Again, Thor was the god of the ordinary people, of all of those who were not nobility, royalty, or with specific ties to nobility that gave them considerable social status, that put them in a social and economic position uh, to not be considered ordinary people, right? Thor was thus the god of farmers, artisans, fisherfolk, and slaves. So all of this research and video to tell you, no, <laughs> no, Thor was not a war god. Originally, he must have been a god of lightning and thunder, and because of this aspect that led this deity to fight the monsters of infertility, the, enti the entities and other than human persons and forces of, of, of nature that prevent fertility from thriving, Thor became the protector of fertility, therefore the protector of life and the things human beings need to sustain themselves and survive. Naturally, it was especially the farmers who revered Thor. However, in Iceland, Thor became something more. Not just a god of fertility, but under the new geographic and um, climate reality of Iceland, Thor became the helper and protector of the people, becoming the ultimate friend of ordinary people. All right, my dear friends, I do hope you have enjoyed today's video and the very first video of 2022. Once again, be welcomed and I wish you all a happy new year, strength of mind and spirit, and may you always find a purpose that will boost your eagerness to live and to continue on living. Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, thanks for today. Obrigado por hoje.